My name is Chris Jeffries and I'm a specialist in urban drainage systems. My talk is entitled Urban Drainage and Green Infrastructure and I'll be speaking about the integration of drainage systems within the fabric of a city. I've been starting by giving an overview of drainage systems in many different places um, where progress has been made but barriers still exist. There's potential for great progress in the future, in particular adopting the concept of ecosystem services. So you might have a green roof to a car park in Germany. You might have wildlife within a pond in the United States. And there are all sorts of other examples where the environment is addressed and the needs of the local people are addressed as well. What are the drivers? What is it that requires improved drainage systems? Well, diffuse pollution from a whole host of examples. You can see um, a dog cleaning van which is releasing soap into, a car, into the road in, the, in one example here. Protection of surface water and groundwater sources through infiltration. Discharges from combined sewer systems cause extreme pollution in many, many locations. And you might have other seemingly less important issues such as reducing pumping costs or reducing erosion, but all can be addressed through sustainable drainage and integrating the drainage within the city. In a European context, the main responses have been through the Water Framework Directive and the Floods Directive. And in particular, policies are now in place in Europe where you've got SUDs are requirements in all new developments, that's sustainable urban drainage systems. Stakeholder groups have been set up because of the requirement to consult with local people. And the most successful examples are through partnership working. Those good examples can be many. There might be a small area at the side of a motorway service area which acts as a water treatment zone and it also acts as a corridor for wildlife. A green roof in a university in Germany. There might be a, a, an architectural feature on the drainage system uh, in, 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 again in Germany. But the best examples, as you can see from the example in Scotland here, is where the urban, uh, the, 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 the surface water infrastructure is almost indistinguishable from the rest of the infrastructure there. But what are the barriers to improving the green infrastructure? Well, capital cost is an important barrier. Developers pay for all new developments uh, and, and they will say, well, this green infrastructure is going to cost us more money. Land costs are based on, on building density, and if you're using part of that building dense, uh, that's part of the land area for the drainage, that will be a cost. There are additional costs, obviously, of building the suds, but what that's not saying is that there are other costs which are reduced. What are the other barriers? Well, maintenance and operation. It's not so much the maintenance cost, because all things must be maintained at some point or another, but it's the change in who is responsible for those costs. So who is operating the machinery will be different. The example in Bogota, Colombia here is a cutting grass. Now previously it might have been removing sediment from a stream and that's a different organization. There might be private companies, there might be community organization, but changes in that financial paradigm and in the requirements Changes are needed. Bar major barriers, major projects, I should say, might be another barrier to, pro to, to, to progress. The example that I'm giving you here is from a river, the Kifisos River in Athens, Greece. The Kifisos River has been entirely built over uh, by a motorway which was required for the Olympic Games in that city. That river used to provide fish for the local population to eat in the past. The final example is a system inertia. How do we change? How do we put in practice our new regulations? Who do we need to train in order to put in place those new regulations? If it's a sewer in the ground, people have been doing the sewers, making sewers for many, many years. No change is needed. 
But if it's a pond which is part of the urban drainage system, then that is a big change. And training in design and operation is required. So where's that progress going to come from? If you've got uh, significant uh, value in a project development, then there's no problem. The money will be there to enable both the uh, infrastructure and the drainage infrastructure to be constructed. But for most urban developments, drainage is a relatively minor cost, and unless steps are taken, then uh, concrete infrastructure would result. So the moving forward is that integration of the drainage system and the green uh, infrastructure using ecosystem services is a very good way of going forward. Regeneration projects and improvement projects can be one way in which uh, many different uh, uh, requirements can be addressed at the same time. Maybe it's housing improvements. Uh, maybe it's a road improvement. And you can see two examples from uh, uh, Germany and one from Scotland where major redevelopment of an urban area, part of an urban area, uh, that major redevelopment is accompanied by major improvements to the drainage network at the same time. And there's very little extra cost where that is done. Financial instruments is another way forward. By that I mean making a charge for allowing surface water to enter into a sewer system. That charge changes the cost balance of a project. If infiltration is made directly into groundwater, no charge. If it's made, if the discharge is direct to the river or to the sea, no charge. But sustainable drainage and green infrastructure need to be a component of that. It's a financial incentive. Better use of recreational space. One of the main barriers in uh, using recreational space better is the inability of planning officers and the design, the drainage engineer, to uh, relate to each other properly. So planning tools are required in order to be able to uh, take into account the value of that green space or the value of a space for recreation, as one can see in the city of Belo Horizonte in Brazil here. Or is it possible to have a small basin at the same location as where children might be playing in a play park? Integration of that space for um, people to use and for the surface water is uh, the way forward. The benefits might be human-centered. There might be health and well-being benefits. Um, but in order to um, realize those benefits, education and training will be required uh, to, to, to move forward. They might be locations of community art. They might be look, uh, associated with schools and be part of an education uh, system as well. Those benefits might also be habitat-centered, where the green space used for the drainage is also an excellent location for um, uh, wildlife and there's nowhere this is more obvious than the city of Bogota in Colombia where wetlands at more than 2,500 meters are unique in the world and they are being damaged by the expansion of that city. So how do we plan for greater sustainability? How do we plan for drainage and green infrastructure at the same time. Well, planners have a key role to play and they must be aware of the issues involved and they must have the ability to take things forward. Traditional planning hierarchies must be thrown away and must be reversed. Technical development of sustainable drainage has progressed immeasurably in the, in the last few years. SUDs are not just technical. They do address a technical function, but now they must encompass the requirements of the local population and the habitat and wildlife involved. We must understand these issues. We must take into account the drainage requirements and the integration of that drainage into the urban infrastructure of the modern city. I thank you for your attention.